So um, thank you everyone for uh, joining us for our next uh, Magnets talk, uh, which is going to be given today by Courtney Sprain. Um, um, but before we begin, I just want to remind people that we'll be talking for about um, 20 to 25 minutes. So please keep your microphones uh, muted during that time so as not to disturb uh, the speaker. Um, at the end, uh, we'll have a 10 to 15 minute um, question and discussion session. Um, so please raise your hands through Zoom and we'll invite you to unmute your microphone and, and ask your question. Um, but if you don't want to um, ask an oral question, uh, we will take questions through the chat window. Um, so please just add a little no mic to your question and uh, either myself or one of the other conveners will uh, read out the question for you. Um, and since these are seminars and we're all sitting at home, uh, if you do have to go halfway through it, by all means, just go. It's not an issue at all. Um, and at the very end, um, we will have a bit of time uh, to catch up with everybody uh, and just have a bit of uh, socialising, which uh, will not actually be uh, recorded. So um, without further ado, I will pass on to Courtney Sprain, who will be talking uh, today about clinkers. Yeah, thanks for that, Greg. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Pointer options, excellent, okay. Um, so today I wanna to talk to you guys about a passion project that I've been working on for the last couple of years, and that is trying to magnetically characterize clinker deposits. Um, by the end of this presentation, I'm hoping that you guys will A, learn what a clinker deposit is, uh, B, believe me that they are reliable recorders of Earth's magnetic field, and also that they provide um, a really neat new option for filling in some of the gaps that we have in the paleomagnetic database. Um, and so this work has been in collaboration with a lot of different people. Uh, Andy Biggin was kind enough to let me start working on this during my postdoc at the University of Liverpool. Um, a lot of this work was done through a visiting fellowship to the Institute for Rock Magnetism, um, in addition to having an undergrad there, Riley Lammers, who performed a lot of this work for her senior thesis. Um, and now this work is continuing at the University of Florida, which is where I am today. So paleomagnetic data um, and a large swath of paleomagnetic data is necessary to capture long-term variations in Earth's magnetic field through geologic history. And this can tell us some really important information about the evolution of the Earth from magnetohydrodynamic processes that are occurring in the outer core. Um, and then it also has important implications for things outside of Earth, uh, including um, uh, it deflects the solar wind, uh, understanding magnetic field has implications for production rates of cosmogenic nuclides, um, and additionally has important implications for the evolution of Earth's deep interior, and then also ultimately habitability. In my particular research, I'm interested in understanding long-term variations in Earth's magnetic field. These are variations occurring on the order of a million years or longer, and how we can tie these long-term variations uh, to processes that are occurring in the deep interior. Uh, but in order to do this, uh, we first need to have a reliable characterization of the recent field, where recent here is the past 10 million years. Um, and this reliable characterization is necessary because we need something to compare these other data sets to, to determine whether or not they're different than kind of this known average. And so looking at what we have for recent periods um, in Earth's history of magnetic data, it's kind of divided into two, two different groups. So first we have our global time dependent field models. And so these have done a really great job of characterizing the magnetic field for much of the Holocene. Um, and additionally, the study came out a couple of years ago in 2018, the GGF 100K model, which extends these global time dependent field models back to 100,000 years ago. So this is a really big effort um, and really amazing feat by this team. Um, and so this record does a really good job of characterizing some important features of Earth's magnetic field, including excursions, but there are many ways in which this record can be improved. And so one of them is we can kind of look at this map of where the data distribution is for the data that went into GGF 100K. Um, and what we can see here is all of these diamonds um, are sediment cores. 
the green dots are volcanic records, and then the red dots are volcanic and archaeological records. And so first you'll see there are quite a few data gaps, particularly in the middle of continents. And then also we see even in the middle of continents where we do have data, basically beyond 10,000 years, a lot of this data is missing once we move beyond the archaeological record. This is also important for understanding intensity changes. Um, so a lot of the intensity records that exist in GGF 100K are from these archaeological records. Over 90% of the paleointensity data that went into this model is from these archaeological records that are less than 10,000 years old. And so we're really missing um, a big picture of what was going on with intensity um, for much of this record because we don't have high quality paleointensity data from volcanic records um, nicely distributed throughout the world. Now going back further in time, we don't have these global time-dependent field models. Instead, we have global data sets of time average fields. Um, and so one particular data set that recently was published is the PSV10 data set, which is a data set that compiles um, directional data only from volcanic rocks for the last 10 million years. And so this is a map of where the data is distributed. And as you can see, there's pretty good global coverage, but we still do have some gaps in the center of continents. Um, and then another important feature of this is this data set is looking at directions only. Uh, so we're really missing variation in intensity. Um, and in many cases, or in some cases, the can, this can ultimately bias our view of what was going on, on or for the magnetic field um, for these time periods because we don't have a full vector record. And so ideally, we'd like to be able to extend these types of global time-dependent field models further back in time. We'd like to be able to connect between the two. We'd like to be able to fill in these gaps and we'd like to be able to fill in more intensity data. Um, but to do this, we need more data. I've said this a lot during um, this introduction. So there are a lot of data gaps, particularly intensity. And in order to extend any of these models further back in time, we, we need more high quality paleointensity data. And so one opportunity to try to fill in some of these gaps in the recent magnetic record is clinker deposits. Um, and so you're probably thinking, what the heck is a clinker deposit? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so a clinker deposit, clinkers are a suite of metamorphic rocks that have been baked, welded, and or melted by natural burning of underlying coal seams. Um, so there's this, there are this special suite of pyrometamorphic rocks, meaning they were metamorphosed by fire. And so basically what happens is we're in this, say here we have a fluvial deposit uh, where we have this coal seam that's exposed at the surface. This coal seam can ignite at the surface due to processes such as spontaneous combustion, lightning, wildfires, a human activity if you're burning a cornfield, for example. Um, and then this burning starts basically, once it consumes this coal, it starts moving backwards into the outcrop. And as it's moving backwards into the outcrop, it's consuming that coal, it's reaching really, really, really high temperatures, and it's baking all of the sediment and the material around it. And it is this baked material, this baked sediment that once was overlying these coal seams that now no longer exist because they've been burnt up, that are what makes up clinker deposits. And so clinker, the term clinker actually refers to all products from this type of reaction. And so it's not just referring to a particular clinker lithology. And so in general, these types of products can be divided into a couple of different groups depending on initial lithology um, and also depending on things like temperature reached and oxidation state. Um, and so broadly, there are three categories of clinker lithologies. We have our baked sediment, these are parts of the clinker that have been heated to the lowest temperatures, around 300 to 800 degrees C. Um, we then have porcelainite. These are baked to intermediate temperatures of 600 to 1400 degrees C. And then finally, we have paralavas, uh, which are effectively melted rock. So these are melts um, that have then crystallized. So these are basically um, new igneous rocks. And these have reached extremely high temperatures of 1500 to 2000 degrees Celsius. Um, and so broadly, these differ both by temperature of formation, but also baked sediment tends to involve um, lithologies that started as sandstones or siltstones, generally these coarser lithologies, and porcelainite generally started um, as things like shales. 
Um, and within all of these different deposits, there's an array of oxidation states. Um, so you can either have really oxidizing conditions and get really red, really orange deposits. Um, and you can also have reducing conditions that produce things like uh, these kind of dark purple to black colored rocks. And these pair allow these really hot temperatures generally form in these chimneys, um, which are regions where these hot gases from the burning of coal are trying to reach the surface and they're convecting within these regions. And so why do, um, why might clinkers be good for, for paleomagnetism? Um, so first, clinkers can be reliably dated. Uh, and so clinkers are not the same age as the sediments around them. You don't normally start getting burning of coal seams until these coal seams have reached Earth's surface. Um, and so that's many millions of years after the formation of these sedimentary deposits. Uh, and so clinkers have been reliably dated um, using fission track, also uranium thorium helium dating, and argon-argon geochronology. Uh, and then clinkers also, because they don't start burning until uh, they're close to Earth's surface, these coal seams, uh, tend to be recent time and age covering the last um, 5 million years to 10 million years. And so in the Powder River Basin alone, this is a basin that's between Montana and Wyoming in Western United States. Clinkers cover basically the last four million years. Um, so there are coal seams that are still burning today. Um, and actually this whole region is called the Powder River Basin from the Powder River, which was called the Powder River because when Lewis and Clark came upon this area, um, they thought it smelled like gunpowder uh, because of the burning of these coal seam deposits. Um, in Siberia, deposits range from zero to 1.2 million years in age of the deposits that have been dated. In China, we have deposits ranging through the Pleistocene. And then in Israel, we have some of our older clinker deposits, which are mid-Miocene to Pliocene in age. And so an additional advantage of studying clinker deposits is they also not only offer an opportunity to kind of study this period of interest, this kind of zero to five million years in age, um, they also offer the opportunity to do this at high resolution. Um, so basically a clinker deposit as it is formed will start where coal is burning at the surface and then it will continually form as this fire extends back into the outcrop. A single coal seam fire can burn for thousands to tens of thousands of years as it's extending back into the outcrop. And so if we're able to obtain samples all across this plateau, we'll or we might be able to see changes in the magnetic field with really high resolution um, for periods of about 10,000 years. An additional reason why these might be good for paleomagnetism is their widespread. Uh, so this is a map of modern coal seam fires, which are shown as red dots, and then clinker deposits, which are shown as these pink dots. Um, and so clinker deposits have been found in continental interiors. This is generally where we have these large sedimentary basins, which coal seams. Um, and they have a wide geographic distribution. They've been identified in at least 15 countries. Um, and as you can see, if we bring back up the maps of where data was distributed in GGF 100K and also PSB 10, we see that some of the distribution of clinker deposits helps kind of fill in some of these gaps that we have in the interior of these continents, additionally providing some high latitude sites um, and possibly some new sites in South America and Australia. And so why else might they be good for paleomagnetism? Um, and so one of the reasons they might be good for paleomagnetism is the process by which they're formed is really, really similar to the process of the formation of archaeological materials or these baked archaeological materials. So it's basically the baking of sediments and clays to really, really, really high temperatures which is basically turning what used to be a detrital remnant magnetization into what should be a thermal or thermal chemical remnant magnetization. Um, if we look at the general ranges of formation temperatures for baked sediment to paralavas, we see that all of these have been reheated to at least 300 degrees Celsius. Um, and considering that in a lot of these deposits, the primary um, magnetic mineralogy is intermediate titanohematite with low and blocking temperatures, all of these products should be reheating above the Curie temperatures of the mineralogy that was originally there. Um, and so at least resetting the DRM, uh, and whether or not it's a TRM or a TCRM, um, I hope to show you by the end of this talk. And another reason these might be good is there have been past studies um, looking at clinker deposit, past paleomagnetic studies that indicate that they are reliable magnetic recorders. 
Um, so Jones et al, and then a lot of work done by Rob Sternberg in the Powder River Basin and also in the Williston Basin. Um, there's been demagnetization work showing that clinkers preserve these basically univectorial um, Thigerville diagrams yielding really good directional data. Um, other work done by Deborah in China has shown that some of these products are um, really thermally stable. So in thermomagnetic experiments, they don't alter. Um, there's been some work done for paleointensity on these types of deposits in uh, the Czech Republic. Um, these are generally old studies, so it's hard to assess the reliability of the paleointensity results. But looking at this array diagram here, we see it looks pretty good. This is a straight line fitting these different components. Whether or not there's alteration um, will have to be seen because this didn't use PTRM checks, but it looks pretty good. Um, and then also, even in deposits in Israel, we see that they also found these kind of univectorial uh, directions, and they match expected directions for the time of formation of these rocks. Um, so these should be good for uh, magnetic studies. But one of the things the other studies did not do is look at a broad range of materials within clinker deposits. So clinkers are really heterogeneous. Um, so there's this wide variety of clinker materials with a variation of oxidation state, variation of clinker lithology. Um, we also have variations in potential temperatures of formations, depending how close you are to the old coal seam. Um, obviously, hotter temperatures are going to be closer to the base, cooler temperatures further away. And so although these previous studies have shown that clinkers have the potential to be reliable recorders, it's still unclear which part of a clinker is good for paleomagnetic study. And so that's kind of the impetus and objective of our work has been to assess the rock and paleomagnetic behavior of clinkers. And this has been, um, basically we've tried to do this as a function of lithology. So focusing on variations that we observe between the different types of clinker lithologies from baked sediment, porcelainite to paralava. Uh, we also looked at this as a function of distance from the coal seam by collecting a few profiles. We looked at this as a function of oxidation state by grouping our results based on color, where darker colors tend to um, be indicative of reducing states and orange and red colors are indicative of oxidizing states. And then also of location. Um, so where we collected our samples, we studied whether or not we saw variations uh, between our clinker deposits and also between different coal seams that they were, or burning coal seams uh, that they represented. And so where we collected these deposits was from the Custer National Forest. This is in the Northeastern Powder River Basin in Eastern Montana. Um, and so these were clinker, or these clinker deposits had formed in Paleocene fluvial sediments. Uh, we collected 101 samples across this region. This is a map here. One of the reasons this region was selected is because this is one of the few areas where clinker deposits have actually been mapped. So we have these nice reliable maps of where we can expect to, to find clinker deposits. And additionally, these clinker deposits, many of them in this region have been dated already um, using uranium, thorium, helium, and also fission track. And so we were able to go here um, and to have this nice framework of where to find the clinkers of known age uh, that really aided our study. Uh, so we collected 101 samples um, from four dated clinkers and five undated clinkers. Uh, and we additionally sampled two profiles extending from the top of the clinker down to the unbaked sediment below, and then also from the base of the clinker uh, up through unbaked sediment above. And so to do this type of analysis, we performed a range of rock magnetic experiments. Um, I'm not gonna go list these. Um, you can kind of see them here. Um, we're basically, we were trying to assess differences in mineralogy, but also grain size uh, between all of these different clinker products. And so let's start with variations in lithology. Um, so to look at variations in clinker lithology, we broadly defied, or divided our clinker deposits and our results into different groups. Um, so we did this into baked sediment, porcelainite, and paralava, the three main types of clinker lithologies. Uh, we also divided into weekly baked. One of the uh, profiles we collected was through a recently burned coal seam fire that seemed to have extinguished relatively rapidly. Uh, we could actually walk out the start of this uh, clinker deposit around the corner to where the coal had not burned. 
um, whereas these deposits were where the clinker, like up here, was at the top of the hill. Um, it had burned for a long period of time and created these strongly baked equivalents. Um, and then we also collected samples from unbaked sediment um, to kind of provide a baseline of what these things looked like before they were baked. And so let's quickly summarize our unbaked sediments. Uh, so our unbaked sediments had one primary remnants carrier. Uh, and so we found that this was titanomagnetite or intermediate titanohematite. Um, and you'll understand why I say or intermediate titanohematite shortly. Um, and so this was because they generally had low coercivity ranges, less than 100 millitesla, and unblocking temperatures below 400 degrees, around 300 degrees Celsius. So consistent with a soft mineral um, with titanium in it to get these lower Curie temperatures. Our weekly baked sediment had two primary remnants carriers. So the first was also this titanomagnetite phase. So we still saw um, the softer component with low uh, median destructive fields around 32 millitesla, and then also low in blocking temperatures less than 400 degrees. Uh, and we also saw this new component of hematite, as one would expect. These rocks are now red when they were not red when we started. Moving on to our baked sediment, we had two primary remnants carriers. Uh, so now one of our remnants carriers is magnetite. It's not this titanomagnetite. Um, this had generally both a low and a high coercivity component, one that was less than 100 millitesla and one that was greater than 100 millitesla, with unblocking temperatures between 400 and 590 degrees Celsius. And we additionally had this high coercivity um, thermally stable phase, this HCSLT phase. So this phase had coercivities that were above one Tesla and had Curie temperatures around 220 degrees Celsius uh, with relatively high magnetizations. And then we also had some minor carriers observed in our baked sediment, um, including this intermediate titanohematite and also regular hematite. Uh, looking at perselenite, we also had two primary remnants carriers. Uh, again, very similar to our baked sediment, we had this magnetite with two variants, both low and high coercivity. We also had this HCSLT phase, and then we had minor carriers that were intermediate titanohematite and then also regular hematite. Now moving on to paralavas. Paralavas were quite different. They only had one primary remnants carrier, and that was magnetite. Um, and so this tended to be our higher coercivity component of magnetite, which, or with um, coercivity levels less than 100 millitesla. And also these had generally pretty distinct unblocking ranges around 575 degrees Celsius. So very consistent with low titanium magnetite. We also observed some minor carriers. So we did see evidence for the HCSLT phase um, in some samples that still kind of had these blocks of baked sediment within them. And then we also saw evidence for some hematite. And we also saw evidence for a phase that had an unblocking temperature above 700 degrees Celsius. Um, and considering the odd nature in which paralavas form, this could be a really interesting magnetic phase. So now I'm gonna walk through some of the evidence that led us to these conclusions. Um, and some of the, it's not all of our data, we had a lot of data, um, but these are the results that led us to these conclusions the most strongly. Um, and so the first one is, uh, we're gonna look at hysteresis properties. So these are some hysteresis loops for different types um, of material that we talked about previously. So we have porcelainite, two examples of baked sandstone, and then an example of paralava. And so what we see is within our baked materials, including porcelainite and our baked sandstones, we kind of have this bimodal coercivity range. Um, so we have both evidence for this really high coercivity um, phase, uh, that was really, really hard, had um, coercivity above one Tesla. Um, and then we also see evidence in this example of the baked sandstone that this phase has a very high magnetization, uh, which would be too high for hematite. Um, in this example of the baked sandstone down here, we have a really wasp wasted curve, um, which is showing our sharply bimodal distribution between that magnetite phase, but also this higher coercivity phase. Um, and then in paralavas, we don't really see evidence for this hard component. We see this dominantly soft curve, which is indicative of remnants being carried by mostly magnetite. And so this bimodality that we saw in our baked materials, both in baked sandstone and porcelainite, 
can also be recognized by looking at sigma values, um, where the high values are indicating a more wasp wasted curve. Um, and so we see our paralavas are dominantly kind of ranging around zero, um, indicative of having basically this one phase. Where our baked sediment and our porcelanite have higher sigma values, indicative of this bimodality of coercivity um, of the minerals that are within these samples and this kind of wasp wastedness. So moving on to um, looking at the day plot and then also the squareness versus coercivity plot, we can see a few more trends by combining all of our data together. Um, so on these plots, uh, the colors indicate the different type of lithology, uh, where blue is paralava, green is our baked sediment, orange is porcelanite, and this pink is unbaked. And they also have a breccia component, which is we didn't collect enough of it to indicate it as its own category. Um, but we did sample one of them, so we included it on this plot. And so basically what we can see from these plots is, first of all, our baked sediment and our porcelanite generally have really high Mr. versus Miss ratios and also um, BCR versus BC. So this really high coercivity range, they're extending really far in this direction um, and then also really far in this direction. And they're the furthest away from our magnetite mixing curves. Uh, we see the same thing looking at the squareness versus coercivity plot, uh, where we do have some falling in between these um, TM60 and magnetite curves, uh, but a lot of the data is actually plotting to the right at higher coercivity values. Our paralavas and our unbaked sediment are plotting closest to these mixing lines, um, not quite on top of them, but more indicative basically that these two phases have more magnetite um, that one would traditionally expect if it's falling along these lines. Uh, so now looking at our results from the ARM um, acquisition and demagnetization experiments, uh, because we had this high coercivity phase, we could not treat the ARM data on its own. Um, and so instead, in order to calculate median destructive fields, we calculated the vector difference sum or difference vector difference sum demagnetization vector for each sample, and then from this calculated the median destructive field. And so this effectively was able to kind of mask out the remaining high coercivity component that did not acquire an ARM and that was remaining after demagnetization. And then we also calculated percent HC or percent high coercivity, which is the percent of remnants that was remaining after the 170 millitesla AF step. Uh, and so looking at our plots, uh, this is median destructive field versus this is the ARM of the component that's already been filtered out for this high coercivity step. Um, and then we have over here percent HC versus that same ARM component. And so by looking at these plots, again, the colors indicate the same differences in lithology. Uh, we can see that the lowest median destructive fields um, are in our unbaked and weekly baked samples. And also that these unbaked and weekly baked samples had the lowest ARM, so the lowest magnetizations, uh, whereas our bake samples of removing into bake sediment and porcelanite, we start increasing our median destructive fields and increasing our ARM, so increasing our magnetizations. Looking at percent HC, we also see that our unbaked and weekly bake samples have really low percent HC, so they don't have this high coercivity phase. And we start seeing this increase in high coercivity phase again uh, when we're looking at our bake sediment and porcelanite samples. Um, Paralava is kind of uh, plot in different areas with both low and high median destructive fields and moderate to low percent HCs. Um, and some of these moderate ones may be biased by having some chunks of baked material within them as well. And so in order to get a better constraint on what was actually carrying this high coercivity phase, we performed a modified Lowry test. And so what do I mean by modified Lowry test? Um, well, by modified Lowry test, I mean that instead of applying, um, that basically instead of doing a thermal demagnetization of ARMs, we did an AF demagnetization of TRMs. And so we applied three different TRMs, one at 700 degrees, uh, one at 600, and one at 300, and then AF demagnetized them up to 170 millitesla. And so in this way, we were better able to capture um, this, this behavior between our coercivity and also on blocking. And so by looking at the results from this plot, we can see that our bake sediment, um, we both have dominant phases being 
uh, this three, anything less than 300 degrees. Uh, in some samples, it's samples with remnants between three or unblocking temperatures between 300 and 600 degrees C. Uh, so this would be indicative of kind of our magnetite phase. This would be our HCSLT phase. Um, and then in the sample here, this orange baked siltstone, we kind of see a mix in between where we have both remnants held in this intermediate and blocking range and also this higher and blocking range. In none of our samples do we see a strong component of magnetization held greater in the 700 phase, so not a strong component of magnetization held by hematite. Um, and then in our baked paralava, we see that most of the remnants is being held by this um, greater than or the 600 phase, so between 300 and 600, so this would be indicative of most of the remnants being held by magnetite. Um, and another observation that we can make looking at this plot is that this 300 phase does not solely demagnetize by 170 millitesla. So this is indeed holding on to our uh, HGSLT phase. Another odd observation of these plots is we have this little dip here uh, where we start losing remnants and then gaining it again indicative of something acquiring a field during these experiments in the opposite direction of what would look like. Uh, and so this might be indicative of intermediate titanium hematite. Uh, this mineral has been found in similar age sedimentary deposits in uh, northeastern Montana, and so it's possible that it's in these deposits as well, and then was accumulated and acquired into uh, these clinker deposits. Uh, and so I'm kind of going to brush over some of the, or the susceptibility results, um, but basically the things I want you to take away from these results are as we're heating, so we have unbaked here, weakly baked, baked, porcelanite, paralava, paralava. As we move with increasing temperatures, increasing degree of being baked, we start having curves that once weren't reversible and altered becoming more reversible, indicating that these are becoming more thermally stable. Uh, what we're also seeing is we have some evidence here for this low and blocking phase. This is probably alteration. Um, and then as we move into our baked materials, we see evidence for this magnetite phase, but we don't really see evidence for the HCSLT phase where we would expect to see. So we don't see this on blocking around 200 degrees. Uh, and then this is the example of that paralava sample where we have this weird high temperature phase um, that still has remnants above 700 degrees Celsius. And so in order to better understand uh, where we are losing our remnants, uh, we performed high temperature hysteresis experiments uh, where we measured hysteresis loops uh, with increasing temperatures from room temperature uh, up to 600 or 700 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so what we can see is first, we have this transition from these wasp wasted curves down to kind of these soft curves um, and then finally into more um, harder curves, which are hard to see here, but you can see it really here in the transition um, of looking at coercivity. We have coercivity decreasing through this 220 degree phase, further decreasing through the magnetite curie temperature, but then after we remove magnetite, it's steeply increasing again, which is indicative of hematite. We also see here, looking at this plot, looking at um, magnetization, we do have this nice decrease in magnetization uh, that has this abrupt kind of change at 220 degrees Celsius. And so this is our HCSLT phase. Uh, and looking at the same thing in susceptibility, we don't see it here indicating that whatever is causing this change um, doesn't have a large susceptibility change. And so the next thing we wanted to do was constrain the um, grain size of these samples. Uh, and so we did this by performing um, fork analyses. And so we saw these broad ranges of behavior of our fork analyses. So these are both baked sediment, this is porcelanite, this is pear lava. Uh, in our baked sediment and our porcelanite, we saw kind of two different groupings um, of behaviors. So one was this kind of grouping where we had these strong coercivity peaks extending out to five to 40 millitesla. And then also these kind of inter weak interacting or interaction uh, fields extending out plus minus 20 millitesla, similar here in this porcelanite sample. But then we also had this other grouping, which had this huge high coercivity tail, uh, which is indicative of our HCSLT phase. In the paralavas, we also saw this strong coercivity peak between 5 and 20 millitesla, but we also saw much larger interaction fields. Um, and so in general, this kind of looks PSD-like, 
um, probably slightly larger grain sizes in these components, but it's kind of hard to tell whether or not these are uh, the real behavior considering they are generally, this one is definitely masked by this high coercive detail, and these ones might be biased by it as well because we know that phase exists. And so to get a clearer picture of this, um, we decided to run high temperature forks. Um, and so what we did is we ran a fork analysis preheating at room temperature, a standard fork analysis. We ran another fork analysis at 250 degrees C, and then we ran another one again at room temperature post heating. And so what we can see here is after this 250 degree temperature step, this high coercivity phase is lost. And so, so now we're basically seeing through that high coercivity phase, and we can see evidence of what the grain size population is uh, for this softer phase. Um, and so it's kind of, it's PSD-like. Uh, and then what we can also see is the comparison between preheating and postheating. And generally the fork diagrams look the same. There's some shifting in this direction, so it might be slightly altering, but generally um, they're magnetically or thermal, thermally stable. Uh, so we did this for a couple more samples, very similar behavior. This 250 degree temperature step is removing this high coercivity phase. And so jumping into changes in color, I'm just gonna quickly run through this. Uh, we broadly divided our stuff into whether it was red and orange, oxidizing, black and purple reducing, and yellow was unbaked. And so looking at these results where color is indicating the color, uh, we can see our red and orange samples have the higher Mr. versus Mist and BCR versus BC ratios, um, and also higher coercivity values, um, indicating that this HLS, uh, HCSLT phase is in oxidizing conditions. Uh, we also have this black, purple, and yellow samples plotting closer to these expected mixing lines, suggesting they have more magnetite. Uh, this corroborated by looking at our sigma values. Our black samples tend to have the lower sigma values and our red and orange tend to have the highest, indicating that they have mixtures um, of different coercivity components. And then looking at our percent HC, we see our red and our orange samples have the highest percent HC and the highest amount of this HCSLT phase um, and also of hematite. And then our orange samples have the highest, so maybe orange is indicating the color of this phase. And so to summarize, our orange and red have more abundant of this high coercivity phase, and purple and black are more abundant in magnetite. So now looking at comparisons by distance from the coal seam fire. Um, so what we did is basically we collected two profiles. One, this is through a ba or weekly baked profile, starting at um, the base of where the coal seam was and then extending multiple meters up. And this one, we did the opposite, where we started at the top of the plateau that had a strongly baked clinker, and we worked down into the unbaked sediments below. And so some of the things that we can see looking at these uh, curves is first, Within uh, a clinker, there does not appear to be any observable variation in magnetic properties with distance. Um, so we do see um, our percent HC changing, but it's relatively high throughout. Uh, same with our median destructive field. Um, we do see, however, large variations in unbaked coal or sediment below the coal seam, immediately below. We see these stark changes immediately in percent HC and also in median destructive field. And we see a slight difference also between weakly baked and um, unbaked sediment as well, but it's not as strong, a slight shift to, in median destructive fields, but it's not as well developed. And so moving on to location, we broadly grouped it into just locality and then also different types of coal seams. So these clinkers are formed in mapped coal seams uh, that broadly represent um, primary sediments of different age. And so first, just looking at all of our different sites, we don't see a broad difference in magnetic properties as a function of locality. That's not already described by uh, clinker lithologies, very similar ranges in each deposit we collected. Uh, and then same for the different coal zones. We don't really see a variation in magnetic properties between the coal zones as well. And so to summarize, uh, our primary controls on magnetic properties appear to be clinker lithology. Um, so if it's paralava versus baked material, and also oxidation state, where it's more reduced, there's more magnetite. Uh, we don't see magnetic properties being a function of primary lithology, um, so whether or not it was a mudstone or a sandstone that you were baking. 
distance from the coal seam, which is kind of shocking, and then also location. And so one thing that we needed to figure out was what is this HCSLT phase? And we believe that it is epsilon hematite uh, or lugophenjite, which I am totally butchering the name of. Um, and so why is this? So the observed characteristics of the phase that we identified in our deposits is they have high coercivity, so above one Tesla. They have low unblocking between 180 and 220 degrees C. They have high magnetization, higher than one would expect for hematite. They are thermally stable. And it's really similar in properties to the epsilon hematite phase that was observed in baked archaeological materials, um, first identified by McIntosh and then later confirmed by Lopez Sanchez in 2016. Um, and so as we can see, all of these different properties nicely match this epsilon hematite phase down here. And Just so, a, a reminder of time, Courtney. Yep, no, nope, I'm watching. I'll be done in two minutes. But thank you. Um, and so we can kind of summarize how do clinkers uh, get their magnetization. Um, so first we have this change of DRM into either a TCRM um, or a TRM due to heating. Uh, we also see an ingrowth of new magnetic material that's either going to be a TRM or a CRM. In our weekly baked clinker deposits, we have an ingrowth of magnetite, which is causing enhanced magnetization. This is possibly a TRM, but it could be a TCRM. In our strongly baked deposits, we have more magnetite. Uh, we start forming this epsilon hematite phase. This epsilon hematite phase in both laboratory experiments and also in experiments forming this phase in archaeological materials only forms at high temperatures above 600 C. So this is likely holding a TRM. Um, and because we don't see really any variation in where we're finding this epsilon hematite phase from distance from the coal seam, we find as much as eight meters away, it suggests that basically this entire thickness of a clinker could have a TRM. And then finally, our paralavas, these are melted rocks. They're mostly magnetite. Um, and because they're melted and we're heated to 1,000 C, they likely hold a TRM. And so to summarize what this means for future studies on paleo directions, uh, the primary DRM should be reset for paleo directions. Mineralogy and grain size are amenable to long relaxation times. So they should record the field from when they formed. For paleo intensity, our grain size is in this nice PSD-like range, which is ideal for paleo intensity. They're highly thermal, or thermally stable, and they're most likely holding a TRM. And so based on magnetic properties, clinkers should be reliable full vector paleomagnetic recorders, uh, but we still, need to, or we still need to assess possible complexity such as cooling rate and anisotropy. And so that is ongoing work uh, that's occurring today. We are running these experiments. I can tell you um, that they look really, really good. Um, and so more work will be coming out on that soon. So thank you, and I will stop there. Wonderful, thank you very much, Courtney. Um, you can all show our uh, round of applause with uh, the Zoom little applause button. Um, that was really interesting. Um, so I apologize for the background. Uh, you, I can open up uh, the, the floor to questions and I see uh, Andrew Kosterov, uh, you have your hand up. Um, if you'd like to unmute your microphone, you can ask the question. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Courtney, for uh, for this very uh, very interesting talk. You mentioned the low temperature magnetometry as a method, but uh, did not show any pictures. Let so, me, yeah. So, so basically, two questions concerning mm -hmm. that. Have you ever seen very transition in any of your samples? You did. Okay, great. Yeah. And uh, did you compare? Uh, Okay, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, so, so, yeah, I would say. Yeah, yeah so we, we have some evidence of potentially a well, very transition. Well, yeah, yeah. This, this, last, this last figure looks like a vervy, but I, I, don't, I don't agree with the left. With the left uh, it's with only the to do with the... No, no, no. There's a separation. It's probably not the verve, um, yeah. but it's some sort of... It's a traffic point, yeah, possibly. We need to, uh, we need to discuss um, it. But yeah, most important, no. most important. Uh, well, from this data, I, I, uh, maybe you, uh, you also have the data where you suspect this HC SLT phase, yeah. So it's and, in these three samples. Okay, but the problem is that uh, uh, 
you may know we started the, the projects concerning the archaeomagnetic archaeomagnetic uh, archaeological samples with colleagues from Sofia recently and uh, uh, my my impression concerning this interpretation uh, of HCLPS epsilon is uh, we, we do have problems with this because uh, synthetic epsilon of uh, iron oxide has a very distinctive low temperature properties and yes. no nobody has, has, has ever seen that in uh, either archaeological material or in your data so no i agree a, yep that is a problem problem with this and yep. uh, if I may, one last uh, short question. What yep. is the range of curie temperatures of your HCLP? Yeah, so I was just going to mention that. So our range of curie temperatures for that phase are, it's not distinctly at 220 or 222, which one would expect for pure, uh, the pure phase. Um, it actually ranges from about 180 to 220. And so it's possible, like the conclusions of Lopez Chanchez, that their phase had some titanium substitution. Um, the other issue is, at least in the laboratories, um, the grain sizes that they were able to produce of this phase are very, very, very yes, small. Exactly. Um, and the grain sizes that are observed in the archaeological materials are much larger. Um, yeah. And so yeah. if this is that phase, um, it suggests that maybe titanium substitution is making it not ideal, but it could also be something else. Yeah. Um, but okay. whatever we have is very similar to what's in the archaeological samples. Um, and yeah. so yeah, exactly. something that's exactly. forming from high temperature alteration. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay, and one more comment if, if, if Greg would allow us. Yeah. In, sure. in, in, our, in our work with archaeological samples, we, have, uh, we had the unblocking temperatures down to 120 for this phase. So it's maybe even larger, larger range. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Courtney. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got a, a couple of questions from the chat. So Gunther is wanting to know what is the highest uh, temperature recorded in clinker deposits. Oh, so the highest temperature recorded is around fifteen hundred degrees Celsius. <laughs> Um, and so that's going to be within your chimney deposit. So that's where you have hot gas that's being convected up. Um, there has been quite a bit of thermal modeling done on clinker deposits because, um, or at least on coal seam fires, because they are a, a pretty big hazard because they release a lot of gas, and then b are a problem for people who want to mine coal. Um, and so they are monitoring these. And so thermal models of basically temperature profiles at the surface do suggest that at the coal seam, not necessarily within these chimneys, you are still reaching temperatures of at least 800 degrees Celsius, if not higher. And we have another question um, from uh, Quentin Simon, and he's, he's wondering if you've already have some paleo intensity data, uh, and what would you say about that? I, I do. Um, yeah, so we've already collected some paleo intensity results. Uh, and so this is them. Um, and this is kind of my slide on that. Uh, but yeah, so we did thermal and microwave ISI experiments uh, and a few DHT Shaw. Uh, and basically what we're seeing is really nice straight array plots. Uh, we're not observing a difference in some of our samples between the epsilon phase and the magnetite phase, which one might observe um, because they have different cooling times. Um, so really consistent throughout. Also, this is all from the same sample. Uh, and so we're seeing really nice, highly reproducible results uh, within the same site. Uh, and then uh, these are consistent with univectorial um, decaying uh, cider build plots. Um, we do have some that are showing two different components. Uh, and this could be because of grain size. Uh, we don't really know the grain size of the epsilon phase, um, but it could also be actually recording differences in the magnetic field during this time period. And so this is kind of also a direction of future work. Good question. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for one more quick question, if anybody has one. So I will, I will throw it out there to you. You flash past your map uh, showing the distribution of clingers. Yeah. And I mean, at first glance, it does kind of look as though there's a bit of a 
a latitudinal band across North America and Europe. Is that due to the distribution of the clinkers or just the distribution of clinkers that have been reported? Uh, let me go to that map. I should have gone the other direction. <laughs> So I believe it has to do with the distribution of clinkers that have been studied. Um, so if you actually look at uh, the distribution of coal seam fires, uh, it's a bit more spread out. There we go. Um, so yeah, so distribution of coal seam fires tends to be a little bit more broad, um, where all the clinker deposits that are on this map are ones that have been studied. Um, it's likely they exist everywhere where there are coal seam fires um, and people just haven't studied them uh, because we know these processes, if there's been a coal seam there, have been occurring for at least thousands of years. So I think this, yeah, this broad latitudinal band is probably just where people have studied. Also, my bad um, like movement of points onto a map might be part of it as well. <laughs> so plotting of data <laughs> problems. Oh, thank you very much, Courtney. Um, so I think at that point we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up and I want to thank Courtney again for giving uh, a really good presentation and, and discussing something that not a lot of people know a lot about. So thank you very much, Courtney. Thank you. Um, oh, you could all see me opening that. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, before we all uh, finish up, I just want to um, make a couple of quick uh, mentions um, before we move on. The um, presentations are now being recorded and we're making them available online um, through the uh, Magic uh, YouTube channel and that's a link there. It's a very cumbersome and ugly looking thing but if you um, just search for uh, Magic Consortium um, you'll be able to find it. So I want to thank um, Earthwreck and the Magic team for supporting that. Um, the videos are actually going to be uploaded also through the EarthRef um, database um, and they're being assigned DOIs, so they're going to be uh, citable objects. So if you do find um, anything interesting and useful in the seminars that we present, uh, you can cite them and give, give the authors credit for, for, for all their hard work and their interest in science. Um, and lastly, we have a number of slots um, still to, to fill. Um, so if anybody is interested in, in giving a, a seminar, um, please just uh, get in touch with us. And as always, uh, any feedback, ideas and criticisms are always welcome. So just uh, drop us an email. Um, and thank you all very much for coming to uh, the Magnet Seminars. And I hope to see you all in a couple of weeks. Um, and I should say, say that we have a, a, a catch up at the end as well, um, which uh, we won't be recording. So if you want to catch up with everybody uh, and have a good uh, chin wag, uh, please hang on afterwards. Thank you.